We all got 2020 But I'm not playing the victim card, and I don't want you to either. We're going to finish the year with some practical, actionable episodes to help you get momentum that will take you into a new life now. Don't wait until January. Now is the time to get in the fight. I'm Brian Tome, and this is The Aggressive Life. When everything starts shaking, only what is stable will remain. That's a paraphrase from the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. That's old school Sunday school right there. But it's true no matter what you believe. The ups and downs of life will shake you, leaving only what is unshakable standing. This year, many of us have experienced some massive shaking from social unrest, election distrust and confusion, global pandemic, and and that's saying nothing about our personal lives. 2020 has rocked us. Many of us had massive problems before all those other things happened in 2020. Many of us are barely hanging on. So we went out and we thought, who can we talk to who understands how to barely hang on? Maybe, maybe a legitimate cowboy could teach us what it takes to hold on when the horse you're riding starts to go buck wild. Todd Pierce grew up in rural Idaho, a bareback rider. He won three wilderness circuit titles as part of the Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association. He since hung up his spurs, but you never take the rodeo out of the cowboy. Incredibly involved, he still is in the rodeo circuit. He works as a chaplain. He's a public speaker. He's a talented horse trainer. He tours the country, literally taming wild horses while audiences watch. He's even found a way to take these tour stops inside the walls of some of the most brutal prisons inside of our country. Above all, he's a mentor who's taken young rodeo riders under his wing to help them navigate the ups and downs of their careers, their families, their life. He's an incredibly aggressive man. He's an incredibly generous man to give us our time today. He looks danger in the eye, and he, he scares danger away time and time again. That's him. Welcome to the aggressive life, Todd Pierce. Yeah, thank you so much. That sounds really uh, courageous. Now, why do I feel like I need to go take another piss? Because I'm scared <laughs> to do a podcast <laughs> did, or did a I, Zoom call. Did I did I just scare the piss out of you already? <laughs> did, or, Something <laughs> like that. I'm like, good <laughs> heavens, what do Wait, I say now? You're, you're a chaplain. You're not allowed to use those kind of words, Todd Pierce. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got rules to this game, right? We do. No, actually not. It's the aggressive life. Uh, even we'll say whatever we want to say and they can bleep out whatever they want to bleep. But we'll, we'll leave that to somebody else. But I've got a whole bunch of things I want to talk to you about here, but you're a horse trainer. Give me the secrets of, of training a horse. How do you do that? Oh man. The short version would be that you make sure that you know how to control your own emotions because a horse is always more sensitive to what's going on inside of you than what he's observing you do. And so technique is important, but more important is what's going on inside of you. Because like a dog can sense a seizure or something like that. They've got a sense that makes it to the, they're more in tune with the unseen world than we are. And so if I don't manage what's going on inside of me, I'm never going to be able to connect with, with the animal. That's kind of the secret of horse therapy, right? The horse senses something in the person or, or what's that about? That's that's part of that. I think, you know, like they would with dogs, that, that a horse is really sensitive to what you're feeling, and they have a lot of times really appropriate responses. And so, like, if we're going to train the animal or the tra- animal's going to train us, if we make it a mutual relationship, then there is a lot that all of us can learn on both sides of it. So how did you ever get into bareback riding? And, and bareback riding, that's riding without any saddle i assume right so it's it's one of the sports in rodeo so there's two bucking horse um events one saddle bronc and one's bareback so bareback you've just got a handle that you hang on to rather than a saddle that you sit in with a rein got it um how you get into it there used to be an old joke that you fill your pocket with marbles and every time you get bucked off you pull a marble out and when you've lost all your marbles and you know you're ready to be a bareback rider. <laughs> Pretty corny joke, but 
you know, for me, I was an athlete my whole life. I grew up with horses and, but I ended up becoming an elite gymnast when I was young, um, did the whole football and wrestling and track in college, um, in high school. And then, so I was a really late bloomer coming to the sport of rodeo because I did that after um, my second year in college, I actually took a drunk bet literally wow. to get on a bareback horse and thought it was fun. It felt easy. Um, it got harder, but, uh, that was how it began. Well, that was my question. Like, how do you, how do you start in that? So alcohol helps release inhibition alcohol sometimes. Really Absolutely. It's like, that's what makes you, makes all of us tough. So what, what makes you, the, so the first time you're inebri inebriated or at least somewhat inebriated, but at some point you're getting onto a bucking Bronco without a saddle and only rope in and of your own mind what motivates you to do that? Or what are you, what are you thinking about when you have that level of fear that's facing you? I think that's probably why we do it is that there's something inside a man that makes him Tory wants to do hard things. And, you know, in the culture I was raised in that that was one of the hard things that men could do. And so there's a level of um, just wanting to conquer the fear. There's, there's wanting to impress your friends. There's a lot of dysfunctional parts of it. But the healthy side of it is that there's something in us that God put in the nature of a man that's reflective of his nature, and he designed us to rule things. Although um, rodeo is not ultimate dominion over anything, you're just getting them rode for eight seconds. But uh, wanting to do that comes from something pretty deep inside a man. Wow. Let's camp out there for a little bit. I My, my personal journey around manhood was I was just a wild child when I was younger. Uh, I found Jesus, and then shortly after Jesus, I found religion, which is really a bad find, and mm -hmm. and that that really made me fall in love with structure and rules and safety and all that stuff. And in that in that time period, I did a lot of reading on Everest, and you know the first guy who took Everest was Sir Edmund Hillary, and he was asked one time, why why did you climb Everest? There's, there's nothing up there to get other than a view. And most of the time you don't even have a view. And his response was, because it was there. That's why I did. And when I first heard that quote, as a guy strapped with religion, I was like, that is so ridiculous. What about your family? What, uh, now where I am in my life, like, I get it. I understand it. And that's what yeah. you're saying. I, I think us as men, we are way under challenged and we are discouraged from doing anything that's difficult and we're dying in hordes, if not physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So just talk more about that. You, you said we're, we're meant to rule, we're meant to take challenges. Just uh, you, you got a vein of truth I want you to tap into. Just get on your soapbox for us. Well, I think that people love their lives to death where that's what, what is becoming more of a cultural norm is that we we're so afraid of dying that we, we never really do live. And that's you know, not that's more than a cliche to me. It's it's something that's actually disturbing. I've got three sons, and uh, we've we've lived on the edge our whole lives. And so it's not it's not just a reckless lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of doing things that are hard that keeps the heart of a man alive. And it doesn't have to be physical danger or doing things with your hands. Um, it could it could be a lot of men just taking some really crazy risks with what they're doing with their songwriting or dancing or whatever it might be that you're always pushing yourself and keeping something in front of you that like Jesus even had to have it. He said that I had to have a joy set before me for me to endure the cross. There's a reason why I'm doing this. And it's not just to win a trophy. It's because it's keeping my heart alive and it starts dying when we quit challenging ourselves. And that I, I believe that in a culture where we're trying to make everything safe, that people are dying on the vine simply because there's something more than our physical life that we're, we're talking about, that we've got a future and a hope and a destiny. If that's really true and we believe it, then that means that we've got to do something about it. And we can't just talk about it or say we believe it. It's going to become active. Yeah, the whole everything COVID related is certainly rocking our world and in many ways, appropriately so. It is a pandemic. It is legitimate on, on many levels. But you, one of the things that we're not talking about as much is the emotional and spiritual and relational devastation it's wreaking on our land and our country. I'm, I'm, I'm meeting more people now 
who are not going to church, they've gotten out of that rhythm, and they're losing their faith as a result. I'm meeting more people who are dealing with severe depression, where they never had severe depression. They're physically safe, but they're now emotionally dangerous and spiritually dangerous. Um, I, I, th I think that we're just, we're not recognizing that, that something is going wrong with us if we're not taking an appropriate risk. An appropriate risk does not include having a helmet on while you're on your tricycle in your parents' basement. That's, that's, that's not risky. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very, it's very rarely I get to be with somebody who's beyond where I am in the risk department. <laughs> Way, way beyond. You said you're. You said you and your boys. You're living on the edge. So, so what does that mean? What's that look like for you? Oh, I would. I would hope that there'd be some age appropriate stuff with that. But my wife would challenge that. That, you know, I've, I've told a story before where my youngest son was uh, four years old. He he was really persuasive in that he could nag me into just about anything, and he had. I had a gun. It was pretty heavy. It was a 44 mag. And he wanted to shoot that gun for some reason. Like that was the only gun he really wanted to shoot. And he finally talked me into it. So I let him shoot the gun. And of course, it came back and hit him in the face because he couldn't hang on to it. And so all my wife hears is a gunshot, a screaming child. And then I'm carrying him in the house and blood's pouring out of his face. So you could imagine what my wife thought when she comes screaming in the room, like what happened? And my only answer was I told him that it would hurt. And so she's like, well, he's four years old. You don't, you don't tell him that you don't let him do it. But uh, so I think that my gauge for danger has always been a little bit off kilter, but um, at the same time, I'm raising three sons that are going to live in a really dangerous world. And if they're afraid of risk and they're afraid of, What's going to happen if they if they take those risks? They're just not going to ever jump. And you know, with with horses, obviously, there's always you know we had lots of broken bones and wrecks with horses with the kids. So my wife abandoned ship quite a while ago. She don't get on them anymore because well, she never had a fair shot at it because everything we had around the house was something in process of getting good enough for someone else to ride them. Huh, so interesting. So has your wife just learned to live with this or she still fights you on it? No, she don't fight me on it. Um, but I, th I think she does help keep me in balance because sometimes I'm reckless just because I want to be reckless and, and there's really not a real vision about it. And so, especially with our sons, there's gotta be some level of, okay, yeah, it's okay to wear seatbelts. In fact, is we really encourage you to wear seatbelts. Dad never learned how to my first truck didn't have one in it. And so we're all taking calculated risks. Everybody here in this is driving a vehicle. So if we're going to take the risk with the known facts of how dangerous it is to drive a vehicle, we're all willing to take risks. It's just that what our culture has taught us is an acceptable risk. And I think it needs to change among men nowadays. Yeah, well, seatbelts, I can put a seatbelt on, which I do, and it doesn't affect my ride at all doesn't affect my comfort or anything like that, but there's other things that would affect my life. I would take a little bit of a risk. I, I would love to see someone do the statistics of emergency room visits for children under 12 in today versus 1960, 1970. I'll tell you what, me and others and you, of course, uh, Broken bones all the time. We just go up our, up and down our bodies. Here's this scar, this. Well, you and I should compare. I mean, you would you would win, but I, I'd be able to hang in there for at least ten rounds on you. Ten rounds of stitches and broken bones. The average kid today has never been to the emergency room for a broken bone. The average kid's never yeah. never. And, and and it's because they're not playing hard. They're not taking risks. And I think this is affecting our psyche. You agree? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's probably the middle middle of my my world right now because I'm so discouraged on on male leadership um, to a huge degree, and I want to I want to make some sort of difference in it that we carry something that's super valuable, and it's not it's not dangerous in the sense that um, it's violent. It's it's it is a threat to everything that's evil, and we should be a threat to everything that's evil. You know, country song says you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. 
And if we don't know what we're standing for, we just become sitting ducks for a whole lot of cultural influence that shouldn't have any voice in our lives. How, how do you see yourself being a threat? What we're doing right now, we're going to talk about what's true. And it's not just an opinion. This is not something that my culture taught me. This is something that the word of God in the heart of my father has taught me through his word is that we are to be the ones that actually shift the culture. We're supposed to want to be the ones that are forming the culture and that us speaking truth into lies and combating that, being willing to stand for it and actually willing to die for it. Truth is not subjective to, to our beliefs. It just is. Whether it's good or bad, it just is. And we get to we get to reckon with that. And if we've got enough guts, I'll say, to stand up to it, um, that means that I don't care if I get persecuted in the sense that you can do whatever you want to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna do what's right. And we've taught our boys that I'm not really so concerned about what you boys are gonna do in life. I'm more concerned as a father on who you're gonna be. In a culture that's so concerned about what we're going to do in life, we've really bypassed our heart. We've bypassed becoming something that's unmovable. And, you know, you had said, read a scripture right there at the beginning that everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. The only thing that's going to be lasting is what's unshakable. And I think that's a father's mercy. That's a father's goodness that he would make it to where we're not building life that's so frail that every time something comes through, whether it's a pandemic or not, that we start wetting ourselves. And um, so us becoming men, that, that's something that gets developed. Well, we're certainly much less physical than all of our forefathers, foregrandfathers were. We, a guy may have a great workout routine and maybe getting physically more fit with his heart rate or his muscle mass but that same guy and others, they're not, they're not out in the cold. They can't remember the last time they shivered. They, they, don't, they don't remember the last time they slept on the ground. We, we've lost the ability to change our own oil, simple tasks that every man would used to do, change their own oil, fix a lawnmower blade, bang something out in a vise, put a square of shingles on. I mean, I, could, I just go on and on and on and on. These were, these were just obvious things every guy did until a couple decades ago, it started dropping off. And I think now the average guy, we don't know how to be physical anymore in, in, in anything. And I actually think that affects us spiritually because walk, walking with God is a, a holistic totality submission of yourself. And that means your physicality. And I just, I just don't see us doing physical things. That's why when I can have someone like you on, it's more intriguing to me than having a theologian on, though I may have a theologian on someday. There's just something about that, that physical, spiritual connection that gets me like, like I've never been bucked off a horse. I've ridden a few horses. I've never been bucked off one because the ones I on, I'm on are tame and lame normally. We can, we can fix that. You can fix that? Like come out to yeah. your place? Are, are you challenging? <laughs> are you inviting me to come out to your place and be on a bucking horse? Absolutely. I won't even make it a bucking horse. It'll just be one that potentially, if you piss him off, he'll buck you off. Then <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have a say in the game. Well, why, why are you so intrigued about me getting bucked off a horse? Why does that turn well, you on? You, you brought it up. So <laughs> I was just, I just want to accommodate, Brian. <laughs> I know that, you know, in this conversation, you know, we, we do fragment ourselves and, and people could listen to this and say, well, this sounds like a bunch of machoism, but really without anybody feeling any shame over it, that's, that's the thing that we, we really need to stand against is that fathers were never fathering. And we've got generations of fatherless men that are trying to fade this out on their own. And, you know, so I've got a ton of compassion for, for men in, in this situation. And, um, it really is what's the plague. It's if you want to talk about a pandemic, it's yes, coronavirus. Um, it's for real, but it's not near as devastating as fatherlessness. Fatherlessness is, is the main and pandemic. Yes, so that that's what's killing us. And so, I'm I'm grateful that I had a dad that taught me to do hard things. I'm I'm grateful that my sons have got you know a dad that's teaching them to do that. But there's so many men that just don't have that, and 
So I, I have a ton of compassion for it and don't want anybody to feel shame over it. And that's why I say, you don't have to get your hands dirty to become a man. You may be a ballet dancer. You know, I was, tell you the truth, Brian, I was a, as a gymnast in rural Idaho, my parents were smart enough to put me in gymnastics because I was really small. And um, did you enjoy that light, nice white lycra tighty thing? All of you look cute. Did you look cute in it? Like it was, it was very attached to me being a feminine man. And so I didn't get it because I was doing way harder stuff than them. And I'd do a standing backflip and, or walking my hands across the gym or do something like that to show off, to try to show them that, look, like I can do hard stuff too. But it wasn't until I, I got above five foot tall to where I actually realized that I could get involved in other sports. But, you know, so as a gymnast, I was doing way harder stuff, but it was just perceived as, as a feminine thing. And so I just think that, you know, in a world where I don't care if you're a ballet dancer or you sit and write poetry all day, you can become very masculine in that if you know ways to continue to take risks and challenge yourself and push it to a limit that, that others won't. Absolutely. I think your, your profession, your lifestyle just has a lot of spiritual transferable principles. Let's talk about if I were to come over there and I was to ride a horse, I would get bucked off. You get bucked off them regularly, or at least you, you did. Um, still do. Still do. When you get bucked off, off the horse, you know, we have all these phrases like, you know, when you get bucked off the horse, you dust yourself off and keep going. You know, all these cliche phrases are there because there actually is truth in them. There, there's, there's a kernel there to bring into our life. So as you've processed through, I'm getting thrown off a horse, I'm putting myself in a dangerous situation, I broke a bone. What are the spiritual parallels for you that help you make sense of it all? If you could like walk us through any of those. I think I'll just give you a scenario. Um, I had a series that I, it was a a tour I was on where it was consecutive events where I was training a horse and given um, a presentation through it. You're starting with a fresh um, untrained horse every time in Texas at the time. And I'd gotten bucked off the horse the night before and broke my scapula, which is my shoulder blade. And which is a pretty tough bone to break and it's super painful, but I had to finish that event. You know, there's a live audience. I needed to make sure that I was making my point, but then the next day I actually had to do another event. So I'm fairly crippled and in a lot of pain, couldn't clear my lungs because I couldn't cough properly. So to get that, get back on that next night, really was why am I doing this? And it comes back to what are the unshakable things or what are the core values or principles that make it to where I can do what others can't do. And it had everything to do with, okay, what do I have control over right now? Because I feel powerless in a lot of ways. My physical strength was the thing that was most compromised. So it made it that more important that what I do get to control is what's going on inside of me. Because you can't go in there afraid. You can't go in there anxious. You can't go in there mad. I couldn't use any of those, you know, anger or, you know, aggression, like raw aggression would have been, okay, by God, I can do this. I'm cowboy. I'm tough. That can't work in that situation. Maybe it could work in a rodeo situation, but that horse is going to pick up on all of that. Mm, interesting. So I had to get back to what makes me feel alive. What, what's, what's the piece here? And if we translated that into everybody's life, I fail. Um, I'll just use my wife as an example. I fail her on a regular basis. Talk about getting back on a wild bronc. Re-entering into relationship with my wife, knowing that I hurt her last time I was close to her, really comes down to what's the core principles that make it to where I can say I love this woman and I'm willing to, to re-engage in this relationship after I've already hurt her or she's hurt me. And and so it it does translate not with without all the the hype and the like you said cliche this is this is a core value that we all get to live with and Jesus modeled it perfectly that's why he could walk into any situation regardless of how dangerous or hostile it might be or even religious it might be and his posture always stayed the same 
and he showed something that no one had ever seen before. Like, you can keep reading the scriptures if you want to. Let me show you what it looks like in human form. So when you're on that horse and you're just holding on for dear life, I got to think that translates to other things that all you can do is hold on. Like, I feel like right now during where we are in COVID-19, like, I, what's, what's your plan for the future? What's your thing? I, I, I got I got no plan. What, what's your vision? Right. Of the, I, I, I got no vision. What, what's, a, what's a win for you? I, I, I tell you what a win for me is. I freaking hang on. That's a win. I, I come, I'm tired. I'm emotionally frustrated. I don't like not doing the things that I like to do. I don't like doing the things I have to do. Uh, a win for me is just to hang on a little longer. And I wish it was only eight seconds. That's all. Am I too negative here right now? Am I too, uh, too narrow-minded? What would you say to someone like me or others who might feel that way? I would say, I feel you, bro. And it doesn't mean that we're going to stop, though, because we have each other's back. You know, there's two different guys. I, I was a mentor, pastor, chaplain, whatever you want to call me, for, for 16 years after my professional career. And I could tell which guys were going to make it on tour, which was the top 40 in the world. I could tell which guys were going to make it in their career by just watching them the first four or five times they got on their bulls. Because the guys that, one, learned how to deal with failure, they didn't change things just because they failed. And secondly, that they only were concerned about the things they had control over. Those guys are the ones that are going to be standing at the end of the year. Hmm. Those are the ones that are going to win world championships because there's so many factors, Brian, that go into a sport like that that are completely out of your control, including which bull you're going to get on or which horse you're going right. to ride. So I drew something that I don't want to get on. We all drew something this year that we don't want to get on. Mm. And, and so we better get back to what we know we were great at. And we better get back to what the foundational truth is that, that got us here in the first place. I'm, I'm here on this tour because I did these things. Excellent. And that's still what I have control over. I got control over my equipment. I've got control over my own uh, fitness to, to a degree. I've got a complete control over my own emotions and my mental game. Everything else, it's just a drawing contest. Mm. I don't get to control anything else. Fit that into your life. What do you have control over? And it, for me in this stage, I've got control over me. What's going on inside of me? And if I lose control of that, I've lost control. So learn from your mistakes and learn to live with what you can't control, which is yep. all things pandemic and election related and everything else related. Yeah. Learn from your mistakes. Um, but also don't take getting falling down as a mistake. Bucking off is not a mistake. Sometimes you just get beat. Mm. So if we're going to walk on water, we better learn how to swim because in this day and age, you know, I don't hear the voice of God well enough to know that I'm doing what he said to do. If I'm doing what he said to do, I can't lose. But when I feel like I've lost, that doesn't need to equate to I need to learn a lesson here. It, a lot of times it does. But if I got bucked off, it's just because I'm trying to do something really hard. We make a joke out of it, but I've gotten really good at getting bucked off. <laughs> like to tell you the truth, I'm better than anybody that I know at getting bucked <laughs> off. And that's why I can do it without creating a ton of drama with the horse. And I can do it without getting hurt a lot of times. <laughs> but let's get good at that. Let's get really good at not being afraid of failing. Yeah, that's a good word. We, we, we don't have high enough self-esteems to recover from failure. We don't have high enough self-esteem. Shoot, man, the average young male doesn't have a high enough self-esteem to ask a girl on a date. You know, it's, it's, it's texting and hanging out with friends, never putting myself out there and actually asking somebody out because we're afraid of failure. I think I, I, men are, we're, we're just shackled with it, Todd. It's, it's, it's not good. It's not good. It's not for, good for our culture. Yeah. Let's, let's do our part in, in bringing some hope to them. All right. A couple other things I got to talk to you about here. Yellowstone. You ever seen the, the TV show Yellowstone? 
I haven't. Oh, come on. How have you not? I, I thought I could, I could hear from you. Is that the way it really is on a dude ranch? Have you heard about it? No, Yellowstone is Yellowstone National Park's just right here by us. Is that what you're talking no, about? See, this is exactly the reason why you're a real man and I'm a man wannabe because I actually I actually stream things on Netflix while you're actually out living your life and breaking bones. No, Yellow, <laughs> Yellowstone is a uh, is a series with Kevin Costner. He it's in it's set in Montana and he has this massive this massive thing he's trying to keep. And, and there's a young guy in there. His name is Jimmy. He's a, he, he becomes a, a rider and he breaks, I, whatever you haven't seen it. So we can't commiserate it. If, if you ever lower your standards and actually stop living your life and watching TV instead, watch Yellowstone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Editorial note after the fact, this is a very brutal show with incredibly mature and some controversial themes. Watch at your own risk. But I'll go on record and say, I liked it. I liked it a lot. All right. Here's the deal, Todd. You have been your your questions have been amazing. You've been like on point and amazing. I think you're up for the lightning round. You think you can handle the lightning round, Todd? You do you do you have the gonads to handle a topic and answer it in one sentence or less? Can you do it? One sentence. I ain't scared. All right. <laughs> I ain't scared. May, maybe I'll let you have it on two. Here we go. Lightning round. A few topics. Give it to us real quick. Best advice for marriage. Learn to listen and make her feel heard. The key to perseverance. Knowing why you're doing it. The one thing, if everybody hearing you today, if everybody did it today, what is the one thing that would change their life? Knowing who God is as a father. Most unconventional lesson you've taught your sons? How to swim. Todd, you're just, now you're just downright boring. You're just like the, you're, you're, <laughs> well, just, the, you're just the rules guy. You're just, I'm going to do one story behind I'm, 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 expect, I'm expecting you to give me like four sentences about how you, you cut your kid's pinky off to teach them manners or something like that. No, you're just giving boring stuff that somebody in the suburbs okay. will give. My son forgot to water the horses, so he went without water for a day. That's what I'm talking about. That's why you're on the okay. aggressive life. Did he die? <laughs> nope. He was just thirsty. <laughs> well, well, I love that. Went without, didn't feed the horse, went without water for now. Now, when you tell him that, does he does he keep trying to convince you that he should be able to have water, or has he learned that when dad says that, he really means it? Well, while he's thirsty, he keeps convincing me that it wasn't his fault until he actually realized that this is for real. So he's I don't know that he's ever forgotten again. <laughs> that is great. Uh, I am so glad that my kids, I was right in the end of it. I was doing stuff to my kids that if parents did them to their kids today, I'd have had child services called on me. I mean, whatever it was, the, uh, the giving my, my son sharp knives when he was four, four and older, every day I come back from a trip, give him sharp knives. Uh, how I would practice spanking. Oh my gosh. You know, spanking of kids, yeah. challenges I would give them. I just, you know, when they were, when they were, gosh, they were young little kids having them at a Reds game, baseball game, walk out of my eyesight and stand in line and get me a hot dog and be out of my, my sight for 20 minutes and then come back, you know, just on and on and on. We got to push our kids. We got to, we got to give them extreme things if we want them to rise up. Yes. Yes, I don't know what good a dull knife is or an unloaded gun. So just treat all of them like they're sharp or they're loaded. Oh, guns. I wasn't supposed to, I wasn't planning to talk about it, but I, I did. I bought a new hunting rifle today. Oh, so manly. Have you ever hunted? Today. 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 Have you ever hunted elk? Yes, sir. Yes. Of course you have. Yes. I, I thought I could ask you something <laughs> manly. Go, oh, no. Sorry. People actually hunt elk? No, of course you have. Well, I'm going to hunt my first elk in a, in a week or so out to Colorado. So I've got I've got a I got a variety of guns, but I do not have a a hunting rifle. So I bought a I bought a Tika and 300 Win Mag. I am I am very excited about it. Does it have a muzzle brake on it? No. It has a muzzle brake that I can put on it. It does come with it, but it's put it on. You think you, you <laughs> or think actually so? Don't shoot it. Shoot it once before you put it on so you can feel what it's like to be a man and kicked by a mule. 
<laughs> it's that bad. Oh, they kick. Yeah, oh. they're not fun. To, you you don't you start flinching before you pull the trigger. Really? So you need to put the muzzle brake on. No. All right, that's good work. Well, see, I've I've never had a gun where I have a muzzle brake or even have the op. I've got a threaded barrel on my forty five, which. Someday I'm going to get my license and put a suppressor in there. But this is my first actual, like, hunting mm. kill. So, I mean, I've got, I've got guns and rifles that are for shooting and stuff, but this is my first, like, long rifle. Something will die with this in my hand, so. Yeah. Well, bring warm clothes. It's winter. I know it. I hear you. Okay, two more. Here we go. Back to the lightning round. Okay. The importance of men in our world. They're every bit as important as women. <laughs> we need each other. But if we're get talking about masculinity, it's absolutely vital to our survival that we learn how to be masculine and dangerous and tender and compassionate. What is the secret to holding on? Everybody needs an anchor. And so it needs to be something that doesn't move. It's the only way you're going to be able to hold on. And you need to know what the truth is about who you are. Todd, this is... Great, great, amazing stuff. Is there is there anything else you're going, hey, man, you, I meant for you to ask me about this, or I really wanted to talk about that, and I didn't tee up. Anything else you want to talk about? Oh, bro, um, uh, you've already, like, I, I want to talk about everything with you because I know what your heart is, but the probably the most important thing would be is that people have got access to a Bible. Make sure that that Bible's leading you to an encounter with a father because most of what we listen to or we hear is nonverbal. And if all we're doing is reading the Bible as though it's a text, we've got no voice to give it. We've got no context to give it. We've got no emotion to it. But when you know that this is coming from a heart of a father that wants to empower and equip people, then, and I, I could say there's one book that I would recommend. It's by a man named Andy Taylor, and it's called Reading a Bible, Your Bible for All It's Worth. And it's just really, how do we get equipped and how do we get fathered if we didn't have a father? And God, that's exactly who God is. And so until we learn to relate to him as father, the Bible's not ever going to make sense. And so that would be the probably the most important thing that I would say in the context of this conversation, because we've got a, a world of men out there that aren't being fathered. And they're like, well, how do I get it? And if you don't have a man to help you do that, the word of God really is a, a living thing that that can father you as you allow Holy Spirit to do that. That's great. Fantastic. So Todd, if someone wants to hear about what you're doing, follow up with any other great ideas you have, any any place where people can go or how people can follow you on social media? Yeah, writinghighministries.org is a website. So that's kind of the pathway to, to anything. We're doing a thing called Ground Shakers right now, which I'm not sure if maybe that's where you guys got that passage from, but it's all about the fact that we're living in a world that's shaking. What is unshakable and how do we get to that? And it's through me working with a lot of horses that, that we teach those principles. Well, there you have it, boys and girls. We've got another episode of the aggressive. Like, how often can you get to hear a real live cowboy talk about physical things and spiritual things? If you like this podcast, why don't you like it? Why don't you subscribe to it? Why don't you tell people about it? Why don't, why don't you rate it on whatever your streaming platform is? We want to get this kind of stuff out as many hearts and minds as possible because people are hurting and we've got some answers for them. Todd Pierce gave us answers today. Welcome to The Aggressive Life. Hey, thanks for listening. For more aggressive living, head over to bryantome.com. Get signed up for the mailing list to get regular shots of positive aggression sent straight to your inbox. And while you're there, you can also find articles, podcasts, and books. I'm also active on Instagram. Search Brian Tome. Special thanks to the band judges for the music. The Aggressive Life with Brian Tome is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.